The new look Big Ten is here with Oregon, USC, UCLA, and Washington joining the conference. From top to bottom, the Big Ten has an argument for strongest conference in the country with the SEC. And for college football lovers like myself, even the bottom of the conference is a ton of competition. Trying to rank teams was so difficult. I feel like most rosters in this league have a chance to beat anyone on any given week outside of the powerhouse team. And again, this is just my personal preseason predictions. There are so many unknowns with an entire offseason of improvement and potential injuries and breakup performances this year. Anything can happen in college football, and I can't wait to get started next week. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with my power rankings and a little about each team along the way. Oregon's my top team in the conference entering the year. I think it's really neck and neck between them and Ohio State. I give the defensive edge to Ohio State's group, but I think the big difference maker here is at the quarterback position and that game being played in Eugene midseason. With their schedule, I could really see Oregon only dropping two or three games, potentially in Michigan in the big house, and then Ohio State at home. At Wisconsin could be a tough one late in the year, but I am going to predict them to hit their ceiling and finish this regular season 12-0. Even if they drop a game or two, they seem like a leered lock for the playoff this year. They just don't have many holes in the roster, and I expect some guys in the secondary to really step up as the season goes on. Oregon crushed the portal this offseason with star quarterback Dylan Gabriel coming over from Oklahoma. Elite wide receiver Evan Stewart comes over from the Texas A&M to pair up with Tez Johnson. And one of the best corners in the entire country, Jabbar Muhammad, comes from Washington. And also a stud at safety in Kobe Savage from Kansas State as well. I expect all four as well as some others to have huge impacts in this team that already was loaded with talent like linebacker Jeffrey Bassa and edge rusher Jordan Birch. And on the offensive side of the ball, running back Jordan James will be the leading back this year with Noah Whittington back for an increased workload. I think James is one of the 25 best backs in the country and will also be playing behind an elite offensive line. So this should really be a special year for the Ducks, especially as an offensive unit. With all that depth and even better offensive line play, they may even be taking a step forward from last season with all the talent they had around Bo Nix. Ohio State is a consensus top three team in the country entering the season after having arguably the best offseason of any team in the sport, landing some absolute studs in the transfer portal. I'm ranking them below Oregon because I trust Dylan Gabriel on a team about equally as talented to have a better chance at running the table, especially considering the two teams face off in Eugene. But I do think Will Howard is a fine quarterback, but he really hasn't shown anything to really wow me to this point. However, with a running back of room of Quinshaw Judkins and Travion Henderson, a solid offensive line, and one of the three best defenses in the entire nation, the ceiling of this team is an undefeated season. The toughest games on the schedule are obviously at Oregon, at Penn State, and then Michigan at home. All three games are losable, but they'll more than likely be favored in all but the Oregon game. So the floor of this team is probably 9-3, but I think the amount of talent they have on defense is going to help them finish 11-1 in the regular season and book a conference championship trip for a rematch against Oregon. The star power between Caleb Downs, Denzel Burke, Jack Sawyer, JT Tuimaloao, and Tyleek Williams is just elite and will look even better if they get breakouts from guys like Sonny Styles and CJ Hicks. Offensively, the receiver room is led by Emeka Egbuka. We'll be seeing some breakouts from the younger guys in that room like freshman superstar Jeremiah Smith and sophomores Carnell Tate and Brandon Innes. With all that talent, it's hard not to see this being a really easy time for Will Howard to run the offense and lead the Buckeyes to a potential first round playoff bye. Michigan comes in at number three for me. There are so many questions on offense this season as they replace McCarthy, Corum, Wilson, Johnson, and the entire offensive line, but I strongly believe they return the best defense in college football. Will Johnson, Mason Graham, and Kenneth Grant are all first-round locks in my eyes, and they've got so much depth at edge that the defensive line should be unbelievably dominant again. They also brought in Jay Sean Barham at linebacker from Maryland, and then loaded the DB room with transfers and now bring even more depth than they had last season. The number two corner spot's up for grabs, but considering the history Michigan has in the position, whoever wins that job should be great for the defense. Now over to the offense, I'm not worried about the offensive line at all considering the amount of PT they saw last season in blowout games, and the history Michigan's old line has had in recent years. The question mark is at quarterback. We know the level of playmaker Alex Orji can be, but can he make the throws needed to win the big game? That's something to have to find out early on as Texas comes to Ann Arbor week two where we'll learn so much about this team as a whole. Around Orji, Colson Lovins a surefire first round tight end, and then Jonathan Edwards takes over the RB1 role looking to finally have his year. I've got my eyes on the receivers early though as Tyler Morris, Samaj Morgan, Fred Moore, and even Amarian Walker all have a chance to break out for an offense that really needs someone to step up this season of the position for them to be as good as they can be. My early shot for Michigan is 10-2, and two, with the defense being a lead enough to beat one of Texas or Oregon at home, and then a loss in Columbus late in November. I have Penn State number four in the Big Ten this season, but I do believe they can be in the same tier as Michigan. We'll learn a lot about this Penn State team early as week one they take on a very good West Virginia team on the road, but outside of that game, the schedule is really not that tough besides at USC, at Wisconsin, and Ohio State at home. Last season, I was part of the Drew Aller's overrated camp. I just didn't think he was performing the way his numbers looked, and they really lacked trust in his ability to get the ball downfield. But now, I think the tone around his name has gotten to a point where he's now an underrated guy. He's got a lot of talent and makes some really smart decisions with the football. But this is a huge year for him to prove that his potential isn't just potential. Surrounding Aller, Penn State has one of the best backfields in the country with Nick Singleton and Katron Allen, and a really good tight end in Tyler Warren. 
but the receiver room is really lacking after the Keandre Lambert Smith transfer this offseason. Julian Fleming is probably the guy, but I've never been a big fan of his, and they're really going to need other guys like Harrison Wallace and Caden Saunders to step up for Aller to be as good as they need. On the defensive end, this group is easily top 10 in the nation to me. Abdul Carter is an absolute freak, and Kevin Winston Jr. is one of the 10 best safeties in the country. Danny Dennis Sutton should be a great edge partner, and I think there's plenty of breakout potential with Kobe King, AJ Harris, and Cam Miller this year. With all that in mind, my early opinion is they finish 10 and 2 with losses to USC and Ohio State. But this team has potential to make a Big Ten championship run if they can get over that Ohio State hump. USC comes in at number five. I think this is a really interesting team that has a pretty high ceiling while also a fairly low floor. There's a lot of unknowns with them: a new quarterback, new weapons, a rebuilt defense, and new opponents. I think talent-wise, they match up fairly well in the conference, and I think the offensive line has a chance to be good this season, led by Jonah Monheim, one of the best offensive linemen in the country. I'm expecting starting quarterback Miller Moss to have a pretty strong first season after his huge bowl game performance last December, and the expectations were even higher for Zachariah Branch, as he's arguably the most electric player in the country. Just 300 receiving yards for him last year, but the sophomore has a talent and role now to explode beyond those numbers this season. At running back, it should be Mississippi State transfer Woody Marks and backup Quentin Joyner. Two solid backs that I think fit pretty well together. The big question for this USC team is going to be the defense. A lot is new with new coordinator DeAnton Lynn and portal additions of John Humphrey, Achille Arnold, and Kamari Ramsey, which give him a really talented DB room. And I think the most impactful addition of them all was that linebacker with Easton and Masseranus Arnold from Oregon State. And then the D-line is solid, but they'll need some guys to step up. Obviously, Bear Alexander can be great, and Jamil Muhammad was solid last season. But in the Big Ten, they'll need to be very deep to hang around at the top. Schedule-wise, they get tested early in a neutral site game against LSU, and then at Michigan Week 4. And later on, home games against Wisconsin, Penn State, and Notre Dame will all be tough to win, as well as a trip to Washington. Brutal schedule on paper, but again, we'll see what this USC team has up their sleeve this season with a lot of breakout potential. I'm power ranking Iowa 6, but I strongly believe this team can finish with a record better than some teams in front of them. The schedule is set up for a potential Big Ten championship game berth, so despite my feelings on the talent being lesser than others, we may very well see Iowa finish with an elite record. Looking at the schedule, the toughest games are Iowa State at home in Week 2, Ohio State on the road in Week 6, and then Wisconsin at home. There are a couple losable away games, such as Michigan State, UCLA, and even Maryland, but honestly, with how strong the Iowa defense should be, I don't see them dropping more than one of those games, if any at all. I do believe they stumbled to one of Iowa State, Nebraska, and Wisconsin, but the other only loss I'm going to chalk up to them is Ohio State, which will give them a 10-2 finish on the year. The ceiling and floor of this team really depends on the offensive progress they've made, if any at all. A better offense could push for an 11-win regular season, and the same old Iowa could see low as 8-4. It's going to be up to the offensive line to do a better job this year, and either Cade McNamara or Ben Sullivan to get the offense moving through the air and take advantage of a healthy Luke Lachey, mainly so they can support LaShawn Williams and Caleb Johnson in the backfield, and keep defenses guessing. On the other side of the ball, we know Iowa's going to dominate, but this defense looks incredible on paper. Jay Higgins, Sebastian Castro, and Xavier Wangpa all crack my top 100 players in the college football list. They also have the all-Big Ten caliber guy and Nick Jackson, Quinn Schulte, and even Jamari Harris out there as well, along with the potential breakout candidate and second-year corner John Nestor cracking a starting corner spot for the Hawkeyes defense. Wisconsin is next at 7. I think this team is being slept on a bit by the national media. Yes, there are several unknowns with how this squad is going to mesh, but I really love this defensive potential as a unit. Ricardo Hallman and Hunter Wohler have first-team All-Big Ten potential, and transfer linebacker Jaheim Thomas is one of my favorite portal additions of the offseason. I also love the addition of FCS star John P.S. at edge rusher, and I think he's a real chance to lead the group in sacks this season along with Daryl Peterson. So we know the defense should be a big positive, but offensively, I think they've got some real pieces too. At quarterback, they bring in Miami transfer Tyler Van Dyke, who's had a lot of hype in the past and hasn't been great, but is definitely a solid quarterback. Chez Malusi returns at running back, and I see Oklahoma transfer Toei Walker being a very high-quality split guy or RB2 for them. At receiver, Will Pauling is back after an 800-yard breakout year last year, and they'll hope for a big year from Bryson Green and C.J. Williams' in position as well. Sophomore Tucker Ashcraft will take over as a starting tight end with a good amount of hype around his expectations. On the line, this is a very experienced group with Mallman, Nelson, and Renfro all being returning starters. As for the schedule, it's looking really tough and could hamper the potential of this team as they'll host Alabama, Penn State, and Oregon this season, and also head to USC, Rutgers, Iowa, and Nebraska. Personally, I see a 7-5 and or 8-4 and season in store, but I've got the floor at 6-6 six and six and ceiling at 9-3, and three, which all seem like realistic possibilities to me this season for the Badgers with that schedule. Nebraska's up here at 8 after an encouraging season that ended really poorly in 2023, but they're another team with a ton of variance based on a number of factors, with the most important one being obviously the quarterback position. There's definitely a chance they opt for Harburg again this year, but my expectation is Dylan Rayola gets the keys week 1, or at least early on this year. And if he's ready, this schedule set up really well for his growth with a couple tests, but nothing too tough until they head to Columbus week 9. Colorado week 2 will be a huge one for how this season goes for the Huskers, especially if Rayola is a starter. 
I like the weapons on this team a lot. Fedone's a really good tight end, and the running back room is deep with Gabe Irvin, Emmett Johnson, and transfer Dante Dowdle. And the receivers are really solid after bringing a 600-yard receiver and Jamal Banks from Wake Forest. And a huge breakout candidate, Isaiah Nayer from Texas. Jalen Lloyd's a guy I really see potentially breaking out this year as well in that room. Defensively, Nebraska should be really strong with starting corner Tommy Hill, who's one of the better corners in the Big Ten, and Isaac Gifford, who is an All-Big Ten safety in 2023. The defensive line is arguably the best part of the squad with Match Hut Matcher in the middle and a dynamic pass rush duo of Ty Robinson and Jamari Butler. The only question mark to me is maybe the linebacker room in the number two corner spot. But regardless, this is a very solid defensive core. Based on the schedule, I've got Nebraska going 7-5 and five or 8-4 and four this year, with the losses coming to any of Colorado, Indiana, Ohio State, USC, Wisconsin, and Iowa. But like I said, we could be seeing a ton of hype around this team if they take down Colorado at home early and take care of business up until the Buckeyes in Week 9. Washington's in the middle of a rebuild year, but still has a pretty solid core to work with this season. After DeBoer left for the Alabama job, they brought in Jed Fish from Arizona, who brought a decent crop of players over with him, including a great running back in Jonah Coleman, and a really solid corner in Ephesians Priceock. He also managed to keep Mississippi State transfer Will Rogers committed to be the starter for this season, and I think he instantly becomes one of the five best in the conference. The entire offensive line is rebuilt, with four transfers taken over after the Joe Moore Award winning group all headed out. I think they've got some potential, but the only one that with a fair amount of FBS starting experience is sophomore tackle Drew as a party from San Diego State. So it could very easily be a very big weak point for this offense. Lastly, with the offense is the weapons. A much different look this year with Odunze, Polk, and McMillan all gone. But they bring in Jeremiah Hunter from Cal, who put up 700 yards and 7 touchdowns last season. And then they'll look for a Giles Jackson or Denzel Boston breakout as a number 2 and 3. And tight end Quentin Moore is the likeliest candidate to be a safety net for Rodgers. Defensively, it's a bunch of new starters as well, but they return star safety Cameron Fabiculanen and star linebacker Carson Bruner to lead the way. In returning corner, Elijah Jackson could help make the secondary a real strong suit for them. Personally, I see Washington finishing 7-5 or 8-4 this season. There's several tough games on the schedule and a ton of uncertainty. The Apple Cup against Washington State and Michigan Week 6 will be huge factors of how the back end of the season is going to go. But regardless, I think Jed Fish will be able to build a true competitor in Seattle in no time. Rutgers is a really tough team to assess because the schedule is set up perfectly for a really strong season for them, and they return a lot of production on both sides of the ball. But I'm just not completely convinced they have enough to consistently win the Big Ten still. So the late September, early October weeks will tell us a ton about how good they can be, traveling to Virginia Tech and Nebraska, and taking on Washington and Wisconsin at home in a four-week period. Luckily for them, they do avoid the top four teams in the conference as well as Iowa. So as I mentioned, they do have tough games, but not a single one is impossible. From a team perspective, the defense is a strong point for sure. Returning most of the defense, including linebackers Muhammad Toure and Tyreen Powell, who should return from an injury this season. Edge rushers Aaron Lewis and Wesley Bailey, corners Roger Longerbeam and Desnick Gnosen, and both Flip Dixon and Shaquan Loyal at safety. All that experience back together is going to make them really tough to beat as a unit for sure. It's the offense I have questions about though, specifically at quarterback, as it'll be Minnesota transfer 8th in Kelly Manis this year. I'm not a believer in him whatsoever, but he is surrounded by one of the best running backs in the country in Kyle Manongai, as well as some really solid receivers in Nassim Brantley, Christian Dramel, and Damir Miller, who's my breakout pick coming from Monmouth. And the offensive line could be pretty solid as they were a quality group last season and returned three starters that had solid depth. But again, they're going to need to be able to throw the football if they want to win eight or nine games with the schedule this easy. I'm going to be expecting six or seven until I see Kelly Manis has improved his ability to do so. Indiana's my dark horse pick this year, not in terms of competing for a Big Ten title, but just being much better than expected. I've seen them ranked at the bottom of the conference by some, but I love what Kurt Signetti has done rebuilding this roster with some legitimately great football players, not only from James Madison, but all over the country, starting with quarterback Cordis Rook from Ohio. He's a very underrated ad as a former MAC Player of the Year. At running back, Signetti brings in Kalen Black with him from James Madison, who had 900 yards last season, and Justice Ellison from Wake Forest, who will compete for RB2. Tight end Zach Horton will also come over from JMU as a productive guy in the past, and by far the best position group on the team is receiver, with McCulley back and the additions of Elijah Surratt, who had 1,200 yards last season at JMU, and then Miles Price out of Texas Tech. The O-line is going to be the main factor for how this group performs. They're already down a starting guard, but they have some other proven guys through the portal. Now to what I'm most excited for with this squad, the defensive improvements, again hitting the portal bringing in basically the starting defense of James Madison last season, which is arguably the best group of five unit in the country. Freshman All-American corner D'Angelo Pons leads the way, as well as a max superstar D-tackle C.J. West. Linebackers Jalen Walker and Aiden Fisher and Edge Mikhail Kamara are the big ones. And my breakout pick this year is FCS All-American corner Sidarius Doss. I really wouldn't be surprised to see him crack the rotation early and make a name for himself at all. Another big reason I think Indiana can exceed expectations is the schedule. I see a lot of very winnable games outside of Ohio State and Michigan. As long as they are as competitive a group as I think they can be, I can see them being as good as 8-4 or even 9-3, but more realistically 6-6 six six or 7-5 in Signetti's first year. Maryland's another middle-of-the-pack team with a pretty favorable schedule, and the success level of the team is going to boil down to quarterback and offensive line play. 
Obviously, we already know the talent level of Roman Hemby, Ty Felton, and Caden Prather as great playmakers in that offense. And we've seen a decent amount of Colby McDonald, Octavian Smith, and Preston Howard to know that they can step up and increase roles this year. But the quarterback battle between Billy Edwards Jr. and MJ Morris might be one that extends into the season. Edwards had a really poor showing in the bowl game against Auburn, but has the edge of continuity with being at Maryland now for his third year. And MJ Morris comes over from NC State having started games at Duke, Miami, and Clemson last season, albeit not the greatest performances. So far, it doesn't sound like either has a real edge, so we can see this play well into the season, like I said, especially considering the offensive line more than likely won't be a bright spot as they replace all but one guy in the line and brought in a few transfers who should help to see the field with a severe lack of experience and depth in that room. Defensively, I think the secondary is fairly strong, with Jalen Husky coming in from Bowling Green and both Dante Trader and Glendon Miller returning. Third-team All-Big Ten linebacker Ruben Hippolyte is back for his fifth season to lead the team, as well as senior edge Danelle Brown and sophomore D-tackle Jordan Phillips, so I can see taking a big step forward this season. My best guess for Maryland this year is 6-6. Six and six. I could see a season as poor as 4-8, and eight, but if things go right for this team, the only game they stand little chance in is against is Oregon, Penn State, and maybe USC and Iowa, with a few other toss-up games along the way. Michigan State had basically a complete overhaul, bringing in Oregon State coach Jonathan Smith to rebuild the program for where Mel Tucker left them. And honestly, this season could be a mixed bag, because I think they got a lot of legit talent, but a lot of roster holes and a schedule that isn't too tough, but has some incredibly tough games. Starting with the offense, I want to talk about quarterback Aiden Childs. Childs is a true sophomore who came over from Oregon State and looked really good in limited play last season. I think he has the potential to be a finish as a top 5 quarterback in the conference this season, especially considering his offense has some real playmakers around him. Nathan Carter returns at running back, and he'll split with UMass transfer Karon Lynch-Adams. Star tight end Jack Villain comes over from Oregon State as well, so he and Childs should have some chemistry. And then Monterey Foster and Jerron Glover were pieces of the offense last year in return. My big breakout pick is true freshman Nick Marsh, who could see himself getting some early playing time at receiver as well. The offensive line has some holes for sure, but Tanner Miller is one of the better centers in the country, so he can help teach the guys while anchoring the interior. The defensive side of the ball could be the downfall of this team. I think there's a few guys I really like, such as safety Malik Spencer and linebacker Wayne Matthews III coming from Old Dominion, but they lost a decent amount of defensive line talent in the portal, and the defense as a whole was already a question mark. The Spartans will really need guys like Chris Bogle, Cal Halliday, and Dylan Tatum to step up and make plays for them as returning leaders for the squad. As for my prediction, I think this team will be in the mix for a bowl game in the 5-7 to to 7-5 to range, just depending on if they're able to beat Maryland or Boston College on the road early or rebound late after a gauntlet middle of the season. Minnesota is a team I could have seen potentially taking a step forward this season, and then you get into the schedule and just see how tough it could be for the Gophers. Starting with a tough home game against a new-look North Carolina team, and then a stretch of Iowa, at Michigan, USC, and at UCLA, and then a final two games at Penn State and at Wisconsin. It's not the absolute worst, but a lot would have to go right for this squad to push beyond bowl eligibility to say the least. Roster-wise, they brought in New Hampshire quarterback Max Brosmer, which is a true talent upgrade over Kelly McManus in my eyes, and then they bring back one of the better backs in the Big Ten in Darius Taylor, with Ohio transfer Sio Bangura taking the RB2 role, which I think was a really strong pickup for this offense. Receiver-wise, they got a stud with Daniel Jackson back, and I'd expect Elijah Spencer and Lamecki Brockington to step up as the second and third options for Brosmer this season. The offensive line actually looked pretty solid to me, with one of the best tackle prospects in the country leading the way in Ariante Ursary, as well as returning starters Tyler Cooper and Quinn Carroll, and true sophomore Greg Johnson who flashed some real ability last year in limited time. The defense as a unit isn't bad. Corner Justin Wally is extremely talented, and I think Ja Joyner and Danny Strigo make for a really solid edge duo. Cody Lindenberg has really slept on at linebacker as well, and Jack Henderson is back at nickel for year five, so clearly they've got some guys on this team. It's just the noticeable holes around them that cause some worry. A lot of youth will be stepping up into starting spots or rotational snaps, so they'll need to learn pretty quickly in order to compete in that middle of the season schedule and give the Gophers the best season that they're capable of. UCLA is another wild card team I personally have pretty low expectations for. It's the first season as head coach for Deshaun Foster, and he could have his work cut out for him with a loaded schedule and several new starters on both sides of the ball. Ethan Garbers will be the starting quarterback after Dante Moore left for Oregon. He had some solid moments last season going in and out of games, so they'll look for him to take a step forward. TJ Harden's back and now the RB1 after a really strong 2023, and the depth of the running back room is a real strong point for the Bruins with Anthony Adkins and Jalen Berger behind Harden. Receiver will be a bright spot as well, as J. Michael Sertim is back, as well as Logan Loya, who led the team in yards last season. And tight end Maliki Matavao returned as well. The offensive line, again, is going to be the biggest question mark for this group. They performed really poorly last season, but they bring back a lot of experience and also added two quality blockers in the portal to help add more talent to the mix. I definitely expect them to improve there this season, but because of the struggles last year, we'll need to see those guys show up on the field for sure. On defense, I think the secondary is a definite strong suit. Devin Kirkwood and Jalen Davies are both top 50 corners in the country to me, and new transfer KJ Wallace could break out of the nickel this season as well. The front seven definitely has some questions to be answered, but the defensive tackle Jay Toya is a stud in the interior, and both Kay Madrano and Femi Ladejo are returning stars at linebacker. I don't necessarily think this USC team lacks talent, I just think a first year head coach stepping into this conference with a rough schedule 
while also having to travel to LSU in the non-conference is a really tough situation to be in. And my best guess would be they may only win four or five games a season because of that. Illinois has a lot of production to replace this season, but they bring back some real talent and have a few strong additions to help make this roster more competitive. But obviously, after missing a bowl game in 2023 and arguably a less talented roster, it could be tough sledding for the group in 2024. Luke Altmaier is back at quarterback after an underwhelming 2023. He'll need to really step up his play this season in order to stave off competition from Donovan Leary behind him. At running back, Caden Fagan is a breakout contender as a true sophomore would look great as a freshman picking up over 500 yards and about 100 touches. But the depth behind him doesn't look great after the loss of Reggie Love. The pass catchers have a ton of question marks as well as Pat Bryant's a lone returner with real production. But former Murray State tight end Cole Russ will take the starting job there and a potential receiver to watch for is Iowa Central Community College transfer Mario Sanders. The O-line actually looks like it'd be a solid this season despite a few big losses. They brought in two FBS starters in J.C. Davis and Kevin Wigginton to replace Pearl and Adams who move on to the NFL. Davis being arguably the biggest pickup of the offseason for them. Defensively, Illinois is typically pretty good, but with how much they lost in the D-line, this could be one of their worst units in some time. Replacing stars like Johnny Newton and Keith Randolph is nearly impossible, so it'll be up to Gabe Jackis and Tara Edwards to do so, as well as FSU transfer Dennis Briggs Jr. Linebacker Seth Coleman is back for a fifth year, and the secondary could be the strong point with Xavier Scott back in the slot and Terrence Brooks transferring in from Texas. Matthew Bailey is back healthy this season, which should be a big addition, as he was a standout freshman back in 2022. Overall, I think Illinois has some solid pieces, but just so many questions that need to be answered in order to get through a tougher schedule of 6-plus wins, and I just don't see that happening this season. Northwestern had a surprising year last season compared to expectations after losing Pat Fitzgerald so close to the season, and they returned most of that team, but the quarterback position became an even bigger question mark after Ben Bryant graduated and Ben Sullivan left for Iowa. It looks like the battle between Vandy and Mississippi State transfer Mike Wright and returnees Jack Lausch and Ryan Helinski could go well into the season, but from what we've seen from all three, none look like trustworthy options to go with right now. But luckily for whoever wins, Bryce Kurtz, A.J. Henning, and Calvin Johnson II are all back at receiver. Cam Porton's back at running back for his fifth season, and both Thomas Gordon and Marshall Lang return at tight end, so the weapons will not be an issue for them. But the big downside is the offensive line. In 2023, Northwestern ranked third to last in sacks, and they lost the gem of the line in Josh Preeb to Michigan. On paper, it's arguably the worst group in the Big Ten, so we'll have to see if they've improved this offseason, which will badly be needed with how deep the conference looks. Defensively, Northwestern returns a lot of production. They lost leading tackler Bryce Gallagher and safety Rod Hurd, but they returned star linebacker Xander Mueller, safety Coco Azima, and both pass rushers Jalen Pate and Richie Haggerty. The group is fairly experienced and could be middle of the conference statistically, especially if they can get breakouts from sophomore Kenny Soares and Ohio State transfer Nigel Glover at the linebacker position. But the schedule is just a nightmare, having to play seven of my top 12 teams in the conference, as well as Duke at home early on. And even the matchup against Purdue being on the road, it's tough to see this team doing any better than 6-6. Six and six. And honestly, I think it's realistic they end up 3-9 and nine or 4-8 and eight unless the quarterback play proves to be a positive. Purdue enters the season as my worst team in the conference. I'm not sliding them, I just think the conference is pretty deep. I don't see many rosters that can't compete with anyone else in the bottom group. I just think Purdue has a lot to replace, some fairly big holes, and a gauntlet of a schedule including Notre Dame, at Oregon State, and the majority of my top teams in the Big Ten. Even the games against teams I think they match up evenly with happen to all be on the road besides Northwestern. So this is definitely going to be another growth year for Ryan Walters and company. They did have a decent offseason with the portal, picking up Reggie Love from Illinois to back up Devin McCoby, and a trio of Georgia guys in wide receiver C.J. Smith, linebacker C.J. Madden, and corner Nylon Green. All three played sparingly at Georgia, so they're high potential additions who will look to make impacts right away for them. Hudson Card is back at quarterback, and I think he's solid. Definitely not one of the worst in the conference, but he hasn't performed exceptionally well or anything. The pass catchers are brand new as Deion Burks, TJ Sheffield, Garrett Miller, and Abdul Rahman Gassin all hit the portal. I'm expecting Jaden Dixon Veal and Jerron Tibbs to step up along with Smith, who I mentioned earlier, as well as Max Clare at tight end. But the offensive line to me isn't bad. They definitely are in the middle of the lower half of the Big Ten to me. Gus Hartwig is an all Big Ten center, and same goes for Marcus and Bo at tackle. The D line's an experienced bunch, but the loss of Nick Scorton was massive, so Yanni Karlaftis will need a breakout as Kydra Jenkins sidekick this year. We'll have to see how improved the secondary is, because outside of Dylan Thieneman, who's one of the best young players in the country, there was a lot of uncertainty considering how poor they were in 2023. Overall, it's very hard to rank the bottom of the Big Ten, and Purdue has some talent to be able to weigh outperform my ranking, but the schedule just looks way too tough for them to make a bowl game this year to me. Here's how I'm ranking the starting quarterbacks in the Big Ten entering the season. Dylan Gabriel comes in at number one, and then I give the edge to Aller over Howard, as I think he's just a better quarterback talent who should hopefully look much better as a down-the-field passer this season. Miller Moss is a guy who can see ending the year at number two, but the lack of experience holds me back a bit for now. Van Dyke and Rourke come in next as valuable transfer pickups, and the same goes for Aiden Childs, although we've seen much less of him, but both him and Orgy could move way up this list if they perform well this year. I've got true freshman Dylan Rayola right behind them, as there's no denying his talent level. And then after that, everyone either has had serious struggles or is a wild card in the conference. 
Garbers, we saw some last year, and he was all right. Hudson Carr, we know we're really getting with him. Brosmer has some real talent coming in from New Hampshire. And then whoever wins the Maryland quarterback battle will not have shown much at the college level, but I would trust either of them over the trio of Northwestern options. Here are my top 30 running backs in the conference. Obviously with 18 teams and multiple backs per team, some guys are going to be missing. In pure talent, I think this is the best conference in the country from running backs. Judkins, Henderson, Edwards, Singleton, Manangai, the list goes on. Jordan James, Ches Malusi, and TJ Harden are three great returners stepping into new RB1 roles. And a few guys further down the list that I'm really excited for this year is Illinois' Caden Fagan, Nebraska's four-headed monster of Emmett Johnson, Gabe Irvin, Ramir Johnson, and Dante Dowdle. And lastly, sophomore Quentin Joyner of USC who could have a big year as the RB2 behind Woody Marks. And don't sleep on Michigan sophomore Ben Hall, although he didn't crack the list. We know how much they like to run, and they'll be using a three-back system for sure this season. For receivers, I'm going to go 40 deep with a pretty standard top three. I think we see a huge Zachariah Branch jump this season, as well as true freshman Jeremiah Smith. Indiana's duo both land top 11, and Maryland's got two cracking the top 15. And I would love to see Isaiah Nayer get back to his true freshman form now in Nebraska. Samaj Morgan, someone I think will take a big step up in usage and volume for Michigan. And the same goes for Tyler Morris, who will likely enter the year as wide receiver one for them. Michigan State freshman Nick Marsh cracks the list. I think they'll want to get him heavily involved to grow the youth core of this team. And then Washington almost certainly get a big year from one of Giles Jackson and Denzel Boston. I'm just not sure which one will be better, so both are a bit lower than they'll likely end up by year's end. Lastly, here's my top 25 tight ends in the conference. Obviously with Loveland at one, I think the top five is pretty universal. And then Fedone, Horton, and Claire are just behind. Most of the list after can be debated or be pretty interchangeable. I just weighed statistics, previous workload as a blocker, and being the number one tight end on the roster a bit more unless the number gap was wide enough. I could easily see Quentin Moore and Marlon Klein shooting up this list with big workload jumps, and both Thomas Gordon and Marshall Lang should be see more usage as well this season for Northwestern. And I went with Caller up over Gears for Minnesota because of his blocking ability, allowing him to be more impactful, but Gears is obviously going to be the pass catcher of the two. Here's my preseason first team all Big Ten. I think Dylan Gabriel is a very realistic QB1 in the conference, both statistically and winning wise. And Kyle Manonga is my pick to lead the Big Ten in rushing this year, as Rutgers still should struggle through the air, but has a fairly solid rushing attack. Donovan Edwards is my pick for RB2 because I think the Buckeye backs will split more than Edwards will, and the Wolverines will rely on the run game quite a bit as usual. Emeka Ibuka, Tez Johnson, and Zachariah Branch should all be the leading receivers for some of the best passing teams in the conference, and Colson Loveland is going to be option one through the year for Michigan. The offensive line is just based on talent level to me. I think these are the best guys in their position in the conference. With the defense, I expect Abdul Carter, Mason Graham, Kenneth Grant, and Jack Sawyer to all land here based off their elite talent, as well as expected production. Same goes for the linebackers. I think these guys will all be leaders of the best defenses in the conference. Will Johnson, Jabbar Muhammad, Caleb Downs, and Dylan Thieneman are my top four defensive backs in the conference as well, which all lands them on first team and wraps that up. This is my preseason second team all Big Ten. Will Howard gets a nod over Drew Aller here, as I think he'll have a better season statistically and winning-wise. Quinshawn Junkins make it here over Henderson. I think he'll be the leader of the split system. And then Jordan James, my top back remaining with a true RB1 workload. Evan Stewart should have a huge season this year if he stays healthy to crack second team. And then Will Pauling and Elijah Surratt should be the leading receivers for two solid pass offenses. Luke Lachey is my number two tight end in the conference, and Iowa should use him often. As I mentioned with the first team, this O-line group is based on how I'd rank them talent-wise as well as team production and importance to them. The defensive line still looks freakishly stacked with four absolute studs, especially on the interior. And then this group of linebackers I think all have first team potential, but will likely miss out because of the star power of the position and maybe some team performance knocks. Denzel Burke is a clear-cut next-best corner in the conference, and then Castro, Wohler, and Winston are all top 100 players in the country who will all crack my second team as well. Now for my preseason All-Big Ten third team, Drew Aller makes it over Miller Moss as I'm expecting Penn State to finish with a better record and him to be rewarded for that. Travion Henderson and Nick Singleton make the third team running backs. They both split carries but are true elite talents. I have true freshman Jeremiah Smith cracking third team because I think it's obvious they plan to use him early and his talent level get him the ball often. If it's possible, this is Carnell Tate, but I think Smith ends up the second leading Buckeye receiver. I've got J. Michael Sardin cracking third team as really solid talent as well, and Jamaz Morgan being the number two guy for a Michigan team that will look to get him the ball in space as much as possible. MSU tight end Jack Velling lands on the third team, as I think Childs use him as a safety net pretty often, and he may even end up matching statistically with some of the best in the country. The third team O-line, I give the nod to the top remaining linemen of the best teams in the conference, but there's a lot of other guys in play for sure. The defense is again loaded with talent. You see the depth of the conference pool with some incredible players landing on the third team. And now with an 18-team league, I'll be interested to see the plan for the number of linebackers or DBs as there are some absolute studs I had to leave off like Muhammad Toure, Seth Coleman, Ephesians Prysock, Isaac Gifford, and Makari Page that couldn't make the list because of the number of spots I had remaining. So we'll see what their plan is for that. That's it for my 2024 Big Ten football preview. 
I'm gonna do my best to get one video up for at least the power four conferences by the 31st Hopefully I'm able to drop group of five previews as well other than that though my week zero picks video is coming in a few days So stay tuned for that and as always thanks for watching feel free to like and subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace